Sí, pues no tenemos por sí. What time do we start? Now. Now we can get started yet. Yeah. Now. <laughs> All right. You're going to sit up here. Okay. Do you care I where? Think... Okay. No, no matter where you want to. No, it's like pants here. All right, hello everyone, and uh, welcome this, uh, to come and start our week panel on uh, finding the right investor. First, thanks to KT for putting up all the all the events for start, to come and start week. And then uh, also thanks Karina for giving us a space. And Karina, can you come up and tell us about everything you do here? <laughs> sure. Um, hi everyone, and then thank you to our lovely panelists for joining us this afternoon. My name is Karina Marcia Harris, and I am the program manager for the Tacoma Maritime Innovation Incubator. So what we do is we realize that Tacoma has a working class port right in our backyard. So with that being said, we help entrepreneurs specifically looking to get into the maritime trade, logistics, or sustainability space, find the resources that they need in order to be successful. So that way they can build and scale their business right here in Tacoma and or Pierce County. Um, thank you again, Jason, for hosting this. And thank you to our panelists for being here. And I'll turn it back to you. Yes. So next, I'm going to have Charlie come up. Charlie's a, a Seattle headshot specialist out of Seattle. He has a special deal for any, everyone taking care of part of this panel right now. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me what you do and your, and your deal for them. Yeah. So um, I'm a professional photographer. Over the past couple of years, my specialty has been headshots for people in business. And a lot of people you will notice whether it's on their website or whether you know it's on LinkedIn, especially when you're in business. Um, when you see profile photos of people, sometimes it's someone holding up a fish. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's someone with a dog. Most of the time it's just a bad selfie or it's just a really terrible crop from a larger group photo. And while those may be good, just to kind of like as an introduction to someone, uh, <laughs> as trite as it sounds, you can only make one first impression. And it's really important that if you're looking for funding or looking for a job or, or anything, um, you've got to make that really good professional first impression. It's so important. I like to say we live in a swipe left, swipe right world. You know, if I can borrow that from a, from a dating app, that it only takes people less than 40 milliseconds to make a judgment about you. Um, so that's why it's important to have good lighting, to dress appropriately for your industry. You also need to look confident and you also need to look approachable. There was a study done, I, I was trying to find it, I, I couldn't find it, I read about it a few, uh, few weeks ago, where even if your headshot isn't all that good and you're still working with someone, even after a couple of months, they still have that first impression of you in their mind. And it does filter their opinion of you. So, you know, even though you think, okay, I'll get the job and yeah, my headshot doesn't look all that great. And, you know, I'll, I'll prove on my work through my work. Um, that filter is still in there. People are still seeing you through that first impression. Um, so that's how important it is. And it, it is an investment. But you know, you invest in your websites, you invest in your marketing, you invest in everything else. This isn't only investing in yourself, but it's also investing in your business. If you have any questions about it, I'll be around. I'll be happy to speak with you. Thanks, Charlie. Okay. Uh, little known fact about Charlie, he used to be the photographer of the rock band Queen back in the day. Oh, nice. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. All right, so hello, my name is Jason Cavanis. I'm the CEO of Founder Cavanis HR. We deliver HR to companies for 49 or fewer people by, by automating HR product and services and um, provide an HR business partner. If you're in, in this room right now, part of Tacoma Startup Week, we'll, get, we'll do a handbook and HR policy for free for you. Also, I'll host a podcast on Jason Cabinet's experience where I talk to interesting people. Dan's been on there. Chris is going to come on. I've had a US Olympian, a brain surgeon, and different people on there, right? So pretty eclectic. So first, we're going to start with Dan. Can you like introduce yourself and, and tell us some, some more of your background? 
Yeah. Uh, so my, hi, everybody. My name is Dan Connivas. I am the managing partner at Triple Summit Advisors. We are a registered investment advisor doing financial planning and investment management services uh, here in the Seattle, Tacoma area, but also uh, where my business partner is located in Boston as well. Uh, we manage about $60 million for clients around the country. Um, but that's that part's not why I'm here. <laughs> the, the, the reason why I'm here, uh, Jason and I met uh, many moons ago through Bunker Labs, which some of you may know uh, helps uh, veterans and the military um, connect communities start businesses. And so through that, and also through my own um, connections and network and just work in the industry and things like that and tech, et cetera, I've come to be an investor um, in, and now I just counted before coming here, seven different deals individually as an angel, and mm -hmm. also three funds, uh, not including uh, the Seattle Angel Conference, which I've done a, a few times as well. Um, so I have a bunch of experience over the last seven or eight years doing individual deals and also being part of funds and things like that, and happy to talk about um, you know, connecting with the right investors and uh, just thinking about how to raise money for uh, your new venture. Thanks, Dan. T. Hi, I'm T. Potter. I'm an investor with Trilogy Equity Partners. Uh, a bit about Trilogy is we invest in early stage software companies in the Pacific Northwest region. So early stage seed rounds uh, with super strong founders building or trying to solve a use case is what we focus on. And then the technology could be large language models or not large language models does not um, it's not a problem. So uh, software companies uh, in the region is some like founders we want to talk to. And I have not actually been to Tacoma before. So super excited about <laughs> meeting founders here building uh, in the space. Uh, we are also one of the few uh, VC firms around here writing lead checks. We lead the round that we come in and we do our follow on till series A. Uh, we have invested in over 85 companies over a period of 17 years. We've been around here for a long time. So super strong network, very, very solid founders. And um, uh, happy to talk about our investment thesis, a portfolio uh, with anyone who's interested. Quickly about me, before joining Trilogy, I've spent nine years leading engineering teams in various companies. Uh, I'm a software engineer by undergrad started my own company for a couple of years uh, for many reasons that seem very trivial now, um, did not understand then, a co-founder, how important they are, how you have to create the market to sell in the market and on a lot of other things. So a lot of good learnings on the ground, um, came to the States for my business uh, MBA and then worked in finance investment banking at Bank of America Merrill Lynch for two years. Uh, before moving to the startup world again in VC and I love Seattle, absolutely. I mean, the place I grew up in back in India could not be more similar to this place and love the outdoors too. Thanks, T. Thank you. Yeah. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. <laughs> uh, I think I'm the only one that's not working for an investment company up here. So I've been on your side of the, the chair before, but uh, have worked for startups and founded companies at many different levels. So obviously as a founder, very early stage, late stage, so have gone to all different levels of investment and been the one that pitches it and tries to get funding. Um, I'm also an individual investor and have tended to invest in diversity-led or veteran-owned um, organizations is my personal passion. And so I follow that with my money. Um, I've invested in businesses. I have five children. So um, a lot of my investments have been with businesses with one of my children. Um, or multiple of my children, I should say. Uh, and right now, I uh, am an executive for a startup, late stage startup called Aptio that was just purchased by IBM. So I keep forgetting that as of yesterday, I'm an IBM employee, <laughs> um, which is kind of a new reality. So we'll see. I don't know. I was telling these guys that uh, I always need to be doing something that feels you know, like changing, driving, building. It's just the way I'm wired. So I will either find something uh, within IBM to drive change and build something new, or I'll go back to the startup world. So looking at Tacoma, I, I just bought a home in Tacoma. So I've lived in Bellevue, Issaquah, and now we're living here. So excited to be here. Thanks, Margaret. Christopher? Yeah, uh, I think I'm one of the less tenured people on this panel, but thank you for inviting me, Jason. Um, I'm with a uh, pre-seed venture capital fund. We invest in uh, business to business enterprise software and uh, government tech, actually. So we like to look at uh, companies that are dual use or that sell to both public and private. Um, 
industries or corporations. And then <clears throat> we, uh, we're not a lead investor like Trilogy, but uh, we're often one of the first checks in uh, after an MVP or the formation of an idea where a company comes about. And uh, I'm a venture partner with the funds. Um, our fund started in Gainesville, Florida at the University of Florida. Hmm. And um, we're new-ish to Seattle. We've been here about two, a year and a half, six months after the formation of our fund one, which we're currently on. Uh, we've made, and we, we just closed our third Seattle-based investment and our 11th investment in our fund. A uh, little bit of background, like personal background on myself, since I've only been with the fund for about a year. I spent six years in government, um, three of that was military. I know you guys both mentioned military. You mentioned you invest in better known businesses. So thank you. Um, and three of that have been in engineering. So I've been an engineer with um, consulting company and the state of Washington, which I currently still hold that role. Uh, a little bit about my personal background other than my professional. Um, I'm a uh, first time even high school graduate uh, out of my family. And now I've been to five colleges and two Berkeley executive education programs. Um, and I'm excited to keep growing in Seattle and definitely being more a part of T Tacoma is, is good. So I'm glad to be here. Thanks. So the next question is kind of off topic, but I think it's relevant. So I start with Christopher first. Can you tell us how you take, your, take care of yourself both mentally and physically hmm. and the importance of founders doing the same thing? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the military helped me a lot in that way uh, with the physical aspect, of course. Uh, I'm a big believer in exercise. I think um, some form of exercise every day keeps our mind fresh, keeps our uh, keeps our mind sharp and the ability to um, grow that way. Uh, and then, of course, mental. Um, there's kind of a hard way uh, or the mental aspect of it is kind of difficult in the entrepreneurial world because if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to be crazy in some ways. So staying sane uh, can be, for me personally, either reading a book or taking one to two hours out of my day, which oftentimes is all I have, to um, work on personal relationships, uh, friends, going out with friends, or um, you know, spending time with family. So it's either through exercise or being social, how I kind of maintain my sanity. Thank you, Margaret. A great question. Uh, so I take health very seriously and I've always worked way too many hours. So it's not, I probably don't have great work-life balance, but I also raised five kids. So um, somehow I call it work-life imbalance. You know, you just <laughs> kind of fit everything in. I don't think there's a separation of, of the different parts of your life. You kind of focus on one thing. Um, I set boundaries. So I always tell new parents, uh, especially new mothers that I coach, you know, set the boundary around things that are sacrosanct. So for us, it was dinner. Um, we always sat down at the table. I loved cooking. Um, I took my kids to school and I just learned how to be very open about that, those boundaries to people that I was working with. And, you know, I'd always say, if, you know, if, if you're a butts and seats kind of person or a butts and seats company, I'm not a good fit. If you're all about productivity and how we get things done and you're flexible, this is pre-COVID, right? Where because we kind of had to be that way there in that. But um, you know, then we'll get along great because I'll, you know, probably produce more than you'd ever imagine, but it's not going to be sitting, you know, at this seat. Um, I meditate and I would highly, highly recommend that deep breathing, meditation. I, I don't think I could calm my mind um, otherwise. A little bit of a biohacker. I'm always looking at supplements and diet. Um I'm gluten-free, I'm mostly dairy-free, so I still need my meat, even though I probably should eat less of that. But so just kind of always looking for ways to optimize and youth and, you know, I just think, you know, being healthy and then staying curious. I just, I love reading, I love learning. And I think that uh, I can't imagine ever retiring because I feel like when we stop wanting to learn and grow, that's when we die. And I see it, I mean, um, and so for me, it's just always wanting to, you know, kind of, keep that curiosity and wanting to understand, you know, what else is there? And, and you can always learn. I mean, I do not have a background in tech, but I just found that I loved learning about it. Um, and so I don't think it matters, you know, education or whatever it's, where's your passion and 
what drives you and what excites you. Thank you, Margaret. T. Um, all great points. I think physical health, everyone has their own style, mm. getting the macros right. So no expert advice there, but it's important <laughs> to take care of food macros and everyone has a system that works for them. On the other side, I would say on the mental health side, this is what I've been trying to do since my startup days when the world seems like a chaos, mm -hmm. nothing makes sense, you have really bad and good days, is two things. Take in the morning, I anchor myself by reflection and it sounds, these are words I taught them, but these are a part of my daily life. And at the end of the day, I take a step back because there are days where you'll have good days. There are days where you'll be like, I wish I could just turn back time and say something different, say something smarter or do something I wish... There's a lot of I wish moments that come every day. And again, the new day overrides everything. Um, in the long, I mean, something I was told at different uh, work-life situations where you must mention you work 20 hours a day, we see you work 10, it doesn't matter how many hours you work. It's a marathon. It's not a battle. Today, if you lose something, win something doesn't mean you lose or win through the whole. Uh, so putting that in perspective of like, how do I feel today? And it, it, it happens more often than not that at the end of the day when I'm driving, I, I just go into my own zone mode mm -hmm. and I kind of replay everything and say, how could I be better tomorrow? How will I handle the situation intentionally might comes again because I was thrown off today? Or if I did something okay, how can I make sure I do it again the next time? Always helps me anchor myself and feel prepared for the next day. In the morning, my coffee is sacrosanct because that's what I anchor myself is like, what do I feel? It's it's just like in given the chaos of the number of things we're handling, it just helps me that way. So that's the mental health thing from my perspective perspective. But on the founder side, there's more that I tell them is, you know, at times you might think about funding or maybe taking time off. You cannot putting money in the business is one thing you also have to carve out that for yourself. You cannot worry about vacations with your family or taking spending time with them you cannot not pay yourself and when mm -hmm. life should be easy for you to focus your all your energy in building your business but if you're fighting multiple fronts that gets even harder so make sure everything else is taken care of and you focus all your energy in business so that you have to carve out some money for that too and taking time off as margaret said boundaries in a way that you need that switch off time. Don't feel guilty about taking the time and mm -hmm. say, should I work? Productivity is more important than how many hours you work and how effective you are. Thanks, T. Dan? So I, I agree with uh, what Margaret was saying earlier about work-life imbalance. Um, I, I'm raising two young kids while also running a business and uh, everything that's uh, you know involved with that as well. And so uh, it, it very much feels like that right now. But one thing I found that works pretty well for me um, is I, in high school, I was an athlete, uh, cross country track and field and wrestling. And so people depended on me to show up, right? I, I need to show up for my team. I need to show up for my coach. Otherwise we would lose or we, you know, we would disqualify or something like that. Right. So, um, I need to show up in the army. Definitely need to show up, right? There, there's no choice about that, right? People depending on you to show up. Um, and I noticed that in those environments, I was definitely my healthiest, or at least from a physical standpoint. Mm -hmm. People were depending on me to show up for, uh, you know, actual physical activities for working out or whatever it is it might be. Um, it's harder to find that outside of those environments where it's not mandatory physical fitness. Uh, and so what I've done that's worked really well for me is I have a friend who's agreed to uh, be my accountability buddy. Right. So he, we, we actually, this is what we do. Uh, this is what we chosen to do. It's just for us. It doesn't necessarily mean it's have to work for everybody. But we literally weigh in every Sunday morning. We weigh in. Wow. That's what we do. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I'm kind of following his lead on this uh, because he's, he's more, uh, he does more research on it and things like that, but it's an easy, an easy way to check. Like, are you being accountable or not? Um, so you can say, Oh yeah, I did three workouts, but, how hard did you work? You know, what did you actually do? It's not entirely clear. You weigh in, you kind of know. So that's that's kind of my the the way I'm staying accountable, and it's worked for me. I just want to throw that specific tactic out there. Uh, not not the weighing in part, but the accountability, <laughs> the the friend to be accountable. With. Is this the one that you is this the one you climb Mount Rainier with? No, it's actually not the person I climb okay. Mount Rainier with. But uh, it's uh, 
<laughs> it's so funny. I would never, I don't think we would ever suggest that to each other. It's funny. He's, uh, have you met Dan? He, he's, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, no, but it just goes to show you different strokes for different folks. I would, I cl literally climb Mount Rainier with this other friend, but he would never, ever suggest, hey, let's weigh in. It was Sunday. <laughs> nice. All right. Yeah. So next, yeah. start with Dan. What made you become an angel investor and why do you enjoy investing? Yeah. Uh, great question. So for me personally, I, I used to live in the Bay Area uh, from 2010 to 2018. And uh, just like here uh, in this area, in the Puget Sound area, you are surrounded by, get constantly influenced by, the, you know, can't help but see technology, uh, entrepreneurship, um, in, investing, right? Uh, all these things are kind of intertwined. Uh, and so I, uh, my entire post army career, I've been a finance guy. I've not been, uh, I've worked at tech companies, but as a finance guy, like I've, I've not been, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to do a single line of code or anything like that, but nonetheless, it, it's something that still is kind of pervasive in the atmosphere on the West, on the West coast. And so you get to talking to people and one thing leads to another. Okay. I understand the finance part. I work at uh, a tech startup, um, but the, the specifically, I worked at a company called Zipline, which does drone delivery. Mm -hmm. um, and you start to understand different ways that you know this company that's looking for investment might that might have a viable path to being something bigger and something more valuable. So you might want to become part of that story, and then um, you know you find different people who are you know very experienced at it. You know, folks like T who. Who, who do it for a living, who could kind of teach you the ropes about, hey, this is what you should look for in a deal and things like that. And as you become more and more enmeshed in this ecosystem, it just happens naturally that that's where your interest goes. And my interest is investing and tech was all around me. So it kind of just naturally happened. Um, and then, you know, it gets, it allows you to be part as an angel investor, or be part of a story you know, generally from the ground floor or close there too. Um, and you get to, you know, be part of something, which hopefully, um, you know, in the beginning, they, those folks might want some of your advice and, and help. But as time goes on, hopefully they're, they become much bigger than, than, than you. And therefore, they don't need you anymore, which is great because that means everyone's been successful. Thanks, Dan. So T, talk about your journey to become a VC and why you enjoy it. Great question. Uh, rewind to the time when I had my own startup. I was the poorest and broke, but also the happiest part of my life. Um, and I just can't explain it. Um, and but from there, when I moved to space, the like tech, startup, banking and finance, I was looking for like what do I want to build for myself for the future? And I was like, I have to do something in the startup world. I have to work with founders because that's where I found my energy. Again, you just can't build a startup by yourself because you need to have a something to build. Um, and I decided. I wanted to come and invest in early stage companies where you're not just looking at metrics and growth numbers for growth stage, but you come and meet founders when they're ideating, when they're traction. That is a beautiful time to come in, more art than science to figure out if that's going to be a worthy investment because a lot of things go into, inside it. Like I could bring in my tech experience and understand, okay, as a product, because we invest in software, how that's going to turn out and then of course the founders the experience it ties so many data points together to make that decision it kind of makes kind of fit into my whole journey and gathering those experience together so i found that to be my strong shoot and i wanted to come to seattle as i mentioned i could have i was also in the bay area before this i mean not for long it was during COVID times a lot of working from home uh but during the time of that two years uh i was in the bay area i'm like I don't think I'm going to stay here for the next few decades. So chose Seattle as an upcoming area of tech talent, took a bit in this ecosystem, which I still stand by. I think a lot of good, we just had a conversation yesterday in which if you look at um, a graph of like num num number of tech talent coming out of the great companies here and the number of investment startups, Seattle is in the top quadrant of available supply for founders, right? Given given the expertise here. So I do feel it's going to change very, very rapidly in the coming years. Um, and I think I'm really happy to be a part of the Trilogy team. One of the few uh, very active uh, leading, the, leading investors in this area where the beauty about working 
with our portfolio founders is we take a board seat, we work with them from day zero to their series A, uh, even after that, of course. And you get to see all, all the motions, like different companies have different go-to-market motions, how they're preparing for series A, and you help them in all these different, which also goes back to your learning that you can recycle to work with future companies. So it's just like a virtual cycle. So the stage, the team, and the ecosystem is, I think, was perfect combination for me. Thank you, T. Margaret, what led you to be an angel investor and why you enjoy it? Yeah, I was I was trying to think what I would call myself because I don't think I ever call myself an investor because I, I guess I'd call myself more of a micro investor almost in some ways, but so often it is my time, I would say first that I invest. Like I am very gracious, I guess, with my time um, in that I've never said no to anyone that wants to say, can I bounce this idea off you? Will you help me think this through? Will you coach me on this? Um, um, I've served on boards. I've been, you know, gratis marketing advisor, product management advisor, because my background is kind of product, product marketing, that area. Um, and then when I have invested dollars, um, you know, it's been varied and it's been everything from directly, you know, into a technology startup. Um, it's been into, I, I just did a restaurant 18 months ago, um, which was an interesting investment. Um, it's been in people. I, I would say the one consistent is it's rarely, I love technology and I, I would say my biggest mistakes as both an executive and an investor is when I get too excited about the technology and I don't look at the fundamentals <laughs> because I get, it's really easy. Like two startups, I can say that imploded. Um, I got so excited about the technology that I, I wasn't paying attention to cues that I should have been, right? Um, and so you learn, but I would say in general, you know, I get excited about the people and the possibilities and just investing in them and their passion and their dream. Uh, which means sometimes you'll make mistakes because we're human. Um, but I would say, you know, my return is watching people and lives change. Um, and I, I had a financial advisor once tell me when I made an investment and I didn't think I was going to make any money back. And at the time, it was a lot of money for me. And he said, could you earn it again? And it, it kind of stopped me because I'd always thought I need that million dollars back or I need that. Like, you know, I mean, I was very set on, you know, getting a financial return. He says, OK, but what did you learn? What did they learn? You know, is there something different you would do next time? And can you earn it? And it, it stopped me. And I like it was a wash, like it was a horrible, horrible investment. And but I did, you know, it's like you come back and you look at different ways. Maybe you have to go back and, you know, work for another company and, you know, work your way back up again and, and you know, have a financial um, foundation again. But, you know, that was one really strong learning and, and advice for me. And then I would say I've done things. I mean, the I guess most human example I can give is I had a young woman who worked for me who, if you can think of every step of the way to have, you know, life against you, you know, single mom, had her first kid at 16, shouldn't have been even doing what she was doing. And just like bad things just kept happening, you know, to her. And my investment in her was I bought a house and rented it to her because she, she was going to have to leave. And I loved having her work for me and I could just see her changing and growing. And so like, sometimes you make investments that make no financial sense. Like I don't, I didn't need to buy a house, right. But to buy a house and have her rented and her the kids could go to school, like was right near the elementary school. Like that's probably one of the most, the investments that I'm most proud of. Yes, Margaret. Christopher? Yeah, absolutely. I think I share some of Margaret's sentiment. Um, one of the main reasons, two of the main reasons I even got into venture capital was one, I'm a naturally intrinsic thinker. I, I'm, I'm a very curious person. I want to know what you're working on. Mm -hmm. I want to know what problem you're trying to solve. And then two, I think one of the biggest resources I could ever have in my network or for me personally is human capital. I love people. I I generally want to get to know you. I want to be around you. I want to know, you know, what you're about, what your background is. And then if I can take that curiosity and I can take, you know, my love for you or my love for you as a you know business owner and then help you in some way, I want to do that. And I found venture capital is the perfect vehicle to to take people and help their business. And then um, 
you know, if you think about the function as a, you know, of what a venture capital venture capitalist does is they provide a network to the founder or, you know, resources to the founder to help them grow. And, and that's really, you know, all I want to do at the end of the day, I want to help somebody grow. I want to help somebody understand. Um, it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what your background is. If you're passionate about a problem and you want to solve it, I want to help you. Thanks. And so that's ultimately my answer. So next question, start with Christopher. What's your definition of an early stage startup? What's my definition of early stage yeah. startup? So for 161, we are free or sorry, post MVP. So we want to see products, but we want to see pretty significant traction. So anywhere from, I'd say zero to 500,000 or maybe not zero, 250 to 500,000 annual recurring revenue is, is, you know, what we'll want to see for the earliest stage of your company, right? Like we're not going to invest before that. And we generally won't invest after that. What was the amount of error? 500, around 500,000 to precede is, is what I, is what our uh, investment fund focuses on. And then I don't want to see your valuation probably above 12, 13 million. So I can keep a reasonable amount of equity for my investment. All right. Thanks, Christopher. Mm -hmm. Margaret, what's your definition of an early stage? Yeah, it's usually seed round to series A. Um, although I think, I feel like rounds have all moved up like a is b and b is c so maybe there's like kind of pre-seed and seed now i feel like everything has kind of evolved in that way um and i i think you brought up something really important that maybe this is a later question but just around your cap table and how clean it is and just as you're taking funding just really thinking about that from the very beginning because mm -hmm. it makes such a huge difference as you go get more funding how people are going to be looking at your company you know, your own return, but I always want to look at the cap table, especially if I'm coming into the company and they're, they've already been through a couple of rounds of funding, you know, then I, I really want to understand what that looks like. So just kind of adding that to your, your mental model and always looking at that is important. Thank you, T. What's your definition? Yep. So for it, there, there are two ways of thinking about it for founders that we're meeting for the first time or first time founders, definitely an MVP. Uh, post traction, we don't have a dollar amount. It could be POCs with the intention of uh, being paying customers in in terms of B two B enterprise. Uh, if it's B two C, it has to be solving a really strong problem, which is in a new market. Greenfield depends upon who others are there, and then also the metrics of like, hey, you have these main downloads, sure, but that converts to your people who have used it one time, completed something, and are paying customers. So. It's, it differs, but some kind of traction, which is relevant for the company, uh, is important. On the other hand, we also do kind of go in earlier with certain founders who are second time, third time founders, maybe also our ex-portfolio founders, which whom we have worked and exited, or maybe someone who has been in industry for 20 years, one of our companies, Maximum Learning, uh, 24, 20, 25 years at Microsoft, building something in their expertise area. And if our bet was uh, usually a bet's always on the founders and if someone can, if there's if there's a solution that exists and if someone can build it it is this team that will build mm -hmm. it or else maybe it'll just a problem that cannot be solved so different ways of thinking about it but i would say mostly for a bulk of the deal for that we get we do look at traction and then uh, we are one of the first institution capital that capital that goes into the company I like you. what you said before, though, that you validate the use case. So they have to have, they have to know their persona, know their use case. Yes. Right? Yeah, I like that. And it's always like, to your point, and I completely agree with you, there have been times where we're like, this technology is so cool. And then you build a tech and then find the use case for it. Yeah. It's it's it, it's a good, it's not venture scalable, I would say. It's a good thing to work on that, but it's more like a different more, dif different style. So now we always like, what's the use case you're solving for is the first thing that we ask. Thank you. Dan? So because I don't do this, the angel investing professionally or venture investing professionally, my definition is basically any company or team that will take my check, basically. <laughs> um, and it, it, That's going to be a lot. I, <laughs> that was the case, right? And I'm going to tell, tell you a quick story of when that wasn't the case. Um, so, you know, uh, I, write typical angel investing checks, um, let's say as, as small as 10,000 and it 
there's I have a lot of conviction in something and or the deal calls for it maybe up to as much as 50,000. Although for me personally, that's really stretching it. Um, uh, but that, that's what I would consider to kind of be a mm -hmm. typical angel investment mm -hmm. sort of sort of range. Some angels are wealthier and they can go higher. Um, uh, but uh, you, if you get a lot, very, very large checks and maybe you're no longer an angel, maybe you're mm -hmm. now kind of a fund. So, uh, but anyways, um, uh, so uh, folks who, you know, I like, I think I can be part of the story and I like what they're doing and, um, you know, I, I see signs that they have a chance of making it, uh, you know, and they want my check. Great. That's been, that's fantastic. And there's no necessarily, you know, revenue target or anything like that, that or revenue size that I, that, you know, is a hard cap for me. I did once have a uh, company um, that I, I forget now, um, you know, who else they were backed by, but they definitely, you know, were, they had, they were raising kind of in a pre-seed round. So they still wanted angel checks. And I talked the founder down from, she, she was pretty clear. It's like 50,000 is the minimum. I'm like, okay, I can't do that. Right. Will you do 25? And, you know, so after some back and forth, she said, yes. Okay, fine. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we, I thought everything was good. Right. And we're, you know, she sent me the paperwork. I'll, I'll sign the safe, that sort of thing. Uh, she called me the next day and said, sorry, we're all filled up. So th there you go. Uh, an example of a founder who didn't want my money. So. Uh, and they're still around. I don't know how successful they've been. I hope they've been very successful. I wish I could have been a part of that story, but sometimes that happens too. That you know, that, that's uh, they're they're too big for me. All right, thanks. So next question this is like kind of like the slight slight exaggeration, but you know, the height myth stereotype is that someone gets an idea on the napkin. Next day they raise twenty five million dollars. You know, and so when founders come to you with high expectations, like how do you like taper it down? Well, of course, you don't want to break their spirit and like tell them you know like stop. But how do you like? Taper expectations, so to speak, like like follow your dream, follow your business, but maybe like tone it down just a little bit. How do y'all work do that? Start with Dan. Okay, I actually have a, a perfect story for this for right now uh, because I, I just experienced this like uh, a week or so ago. Um, a very very good friend in the Bay Area who is a uh, marketing professional in the games industry, um, uh, very talented, uh, you know, twenty years of experience, knows what he's doing, and he's worked for a lot of the big game developers um, in the world, actually, not just uh, here in America. Um, and he started a, a new studio. Uh, and I think their angle is great. What they're trying to build is great. Um, the specific type of game development they're doing is um, very of the moment. Um, in their deck, uh, originally, they mentioned that they wanted to raise like $5 million or something like that, right? And, and they also told me, this gentleman who never raised money before, he also told me, oh, I also, you know, we're raising money from angels. And I'm like, okay, if you're raising $5 million, if that's what you're shooting for, you know, like what angel checks are you looking for? And and he was like, okay, we're not going to like, you know, based on what my co-founder said, we, we're not going to go under $250,000 for an angel check. I'm like, okay, you just, you right. just eliminated the vast majority of angels out there. Sorry, like that's, that, that doesn't work, right? And so that this happens all the time where folks who've never done this before um, have, you know, uh, an idea that, or some thought in their head that, you know, doesn't really jive with the market. And this is where you go out to the market and try to get that feedback mm -hmm. so that you can present, you know, your best foot forward, uh, forward and make sure that what you're looking for matches the market you're trying to raise from. Otherwise you're just wasting everyone's time. So that's the type of feedback I give to folks. Um, and, you know, not his fault. I, I love this gentleman. He, he's great, but um, he'd never raised money before. And so th this is what the feedback that not just me, but other folks have given. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, talking about the repeat founders or, or people who are doing it for the second time, if they come up with an idea, never has happened that they've come up with a napkin, but more like a, this is what I want to do. And we do give our time uh, to iterate the idea with them. And it, ta it may take like two months and three months and four months to help them flesh out. And these are not for everyone, but some someone we have worked with before was like, okay, let's help help you answer questions that would help you narrow down your idea and build something so that's one process that we take very seriously three of our investments in tap two or our latest fund has been to that mm -hmm. on the other hand we also get to meet a vast majority of founders in which some of them would once you have gone through the deck the first question question is where are you at your mvp mm -hmm. and to be like you just realized you just saw wireframes um, or maybe screenshots and designs. 
great idea, but we are always, I would say, always, always nice and courteous and say, this sounds great given the way our investment focus works. We would need to see some traction and the MVP needs to be there. So why don't we touch base again in like how, how long do you need to build it? Like six months, 12 wow. months? And it has also happened. And then we make sure we check in. If we, if we like the premise on the idea, we check in. But it's just like navigating. And if it was an upcoming, we would say, all right, we'll talk to you, come back again. So it depends how they approach. Okay. Uh, but we always make sure, as you said, Margaret, like we take the time. We never mm -hmm. say, oh, you're too busy for you. Mm -hmm. Spend the time with them. Maybe some something in your conversation will help them, which will make help them with the idea. But it's never investment grade uh, situation at that time. All right. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, I, I like what what Dan said because I think angel investing is perfect to help you get to the point where you have that POC, where you have that MVP. So usually, the first step I'm seeing is a feasibility plan, a business plan, a, I always say, document it, write it down, because there is an incredible exercise um, writing something into a document that is structured. Um, and you can find templates of it everywhere. If it's a first time, you know, kind of business founder, um, getting them to put that into words. And then the first thing I do is I'll read through that and put, you know, comments throughout and tell them to go have 10 people read this from all different places, their mother, it doesn't matter, like just have people read this and make sure they understand it. Um, and I, I just had a former colleague of mine um, that reached out that has this concept of, a, I'll just call it a community platform for, for ease of, of description. And every time I've talked to him the last three times, it goes in a different direction, right? And I'm like, okay, I love your passion. I love your ideas. But as soon as someone says blue, then you move and it's blue, right? As someone says green, you're immediately going green. It's like, what is the MVP? What is the core place you're going to start? Like just start mm -hmm. and focus, right? And then what is the business model? Because that kept changing too, right? So those are the things that I will always look for. And you still have to have those pieces, but usually if there's someone as an angel investor type, they will also play that kind of advisor role. I mean, I love that you do that with people that you've worked with before. So find those people that you trust. And then if there's a point where you need the 20, 25, 50, 100,000, sometimes it'll go up that high. Um, to get that together, then you're in a position, right, to go validate it in the market. You have something to show to potential customers. You have something to show then to, you know, the, the next level of investor that can mm -hmm. give you the million, two million, five million, whatever it is that you need. But that that voice of truth and someone you can trust to rip it apart, because trust me, it doesn't matter how many times I've done this, it gets ripped apart. Um, so someone that has that compassion, but has been there that can really push you on that and finding that business model, finding that use case, finding that right customer and the, and the persona within those customers is key. Thanks, Margaret. Christopher. Absolutely. I think, uh, to get, you know, founder or founders, um, on the right track, if they're off of it, uh, they need to fundam fundamentally understand their business or what they're trying to sell to the end user. Um, if they have an inflated valuation, helping them understand their TAM might be a good starting point. Like, you know, what's uh, what do you ultimately want to grow your business to become? And then do you have this early traction to back that up? Um, I think, um, and just talking post-product, right? Not, not, not pre-idea, but if you have an MVP. Um, and then, of course, giving advice, like T said, um, finding... If you're a first time founder, maybe finding a serial founder that you could talk to or somebody in the same space you're trying to work in to give you advice is is a great starting point, um, especially if you're talking to investors that aren't operators. You, you definitely want to have some kind of operating advice to uh, to go off of, um, whether that be through an accelerator program, an incubator or something. Uh, and then having, you know, those resources to, to utilize to get the correct valuation, uh, I think can be important. Um, and then, of course, having traction, right? Um, if you're not sure where to value, <clears throat> you can look potentially at competitors. If there's any competitors already building in that space that may be ahead of you. Um, if this is your, if you don't see any competitors, 
Um, you know, do you have letters of intent? Do you have customers that are going to buy your product or maybe have verbally said they want your product? Um, finding those those metrics to correctly value what you're building can be extremely important in the early stages. Thanks. So next question, two part question. I'll start with Christopher. What's a final characteristic that influences you to say yes? And a final characteristic that influences you, influence you to say no? Mm. A founder characteristic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, yes, um, I and a, I'll just start with one of the most important ones we, we may look for, uh, especially in the early stages, right? Like if a founder hasn't built something in the past, maybe they're a first time founder. We want to look for founders that have been through adversity. Have they have they overcome a big challenge in their life? And how did they get through that? And did they come out, you know, on top on the other side? Um, I think that can be incredibly important to speaking to the mindset of, of the founder if they can get through these hard challenges uh, when building a company because it's going to come often. Right. Like you, you have to have that mindset to get over those humps. And then something that might turn me away from a founder is if they're stuck on solo building the company. Um, a founder that may think, I don't need advice. I don't need help. I don't Supposed need anybody. Ability. Right. I don't need anybody else to tell me what to do. Um, I can build this on my own. Like that's going to be a big red flag for most investors, I think. All right, thank you. Margaret? I would say integrity first. I look for both in founders, but also in you know other leaders I want to work with. Mm -hmm. So in co-founders or mm -hmm. other executives, or if I'm going to work for a company, you know, the CEO um, at that company. Um, and I'm always amazed at, that that's a superpower, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, and so that would be number one. I think courage is really important. Um, kind of speaking to what you do, it just, it takes a lot of courage, you know, to start something up. Um, you're putting your whole world into it and, you know, sometimes putting things at risk. Um, and then curiosity, I'm going to go back to that because there is just something, you can see it in people when they're, when they're doing this because they really want to change the world in their way. Mm -hmm. And that change the world passion, uh, you, you honestly, you can't, you can't make someone have that. Like it's just naturally in you or not. Um, so those are top of mind. And then, I mean, there's smarts and there's a whole bunch of other things, but like the things that, you know, just really suck me in. And then I, I agree, arrogance. Um, I will turn the other way in 10 seconds. If you are coming off as someone who, you know, you have something no one else has solved, which is never true. Um, you know, you're better than anyone else, which is never true. You're smarter than someone else. You're more connected. You're more, whatever it is. And I meet people like that all the time. And it just, I, I have a really hard time, not just shutting down. You know, with that. Thank you, Margaret. T? Yeah. Uh, all great points. Don't want to rephrase. Uh, <laughs> but for us, coachability is super mm. important. And the way we think is a lot of times we hear those questions like, oh, I do I have to have a deck? Do I have to pitch to founders? Sorry, to investors. And the reason that investors take a look at the founders so hard is that in the beginning years of a startup, the founder is the person selling to customers. And if you can't, you have to convince your customers to buy a product, we are just a demo for you. So can you convince us? Uh, and it comes through, as you said, passion for the product. It doesn't, vision, the right? vision, yeah. it's not, no one needs to be a salesman here, but the vision, the passion, why you're building it, being having the clarity of thought. So we look for that, like, is, is that, is there a clear vision? And also being super self-aware that it'll change. Uh, companies pivot, the idea changes based on the feedback you get from the market. A product will go to different motions, but are you flexible enough to be responding to all those uh, changes? Or as you said, the arrogance part, like I'm gonna build what I want and then everyone else can figure it out. And then I'm going to, and if you ask them like, why will your customers use it? You just come up with a very random thing uh, because there's, I mean, there has it's a it's a spectrum of many soft qualities that you kind of pick up when you're talking to them. But these are um, one of the few ones, and integrity too. You need to make sure that they. It's very hard to judge it in the first few mm -hmm. meetings, but I think being the self awareness part, like when you ask all these questions, it's okay to say, 
that's a good one. I haven't figured it out. Let me circle back with you. Absolutely perfect. Instead of being defensive, which is also we take very uh, seriously about like how will you respond to changing situations? And given that a business takes eight to 10 years to build, how strong is the founder or the team and the team dynamic? The team has to have a very, because the times are going to get tough in the yeah. future. How will this team weather the storm? Thanks, Dean. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to use two concepts from Warren Buffett uh, to, to answer this. And uh, normally, we're, when we're talking about angel investing and, and venture and things like that, Warren Buffett normally doesn't enter the conversation, but uh, I think it's pretty appropriate here in, in uh, the uh, wealth management world. Uh, certainly, when we talk about Warren Buffett's concepts a lot. Um, so in angel investing and just looking at deals and idea or and potential investments, I'm constantly putting things into the too hard pile. I don't understand it. The situation doesn't look right. I don't have time to invest in it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, 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 it takes me, it takes a certain threshold, a pretty high threshold for me to want to dig in. Most things just go into, again, Warren Buffett's idea of the too hard pile. You just stay away from those things because um, otherwise you fool yourself into thinking that you know uh, more than you actually do. Uh, I'm constantly trying not to do that. Uh, and so along those lines, so the, the things that I'm looking for in a founder really actually, um, and again, because it's too hard otherwise, is experience. So if you founded a company before, great. If you're an experienced executive, that, that you have relevant experience, but this is your first time founding a company, great. If you're just starting out and you have an idea and you haven't done this before at all, you don't have any business experience at all, probably going to be in a too hard pile for me. That's just my personal bias, but th this is... This is just um, you know, the amount of time I have to invest in and how deep I can personally go in these things. That's how I do it. And then for the things that are immediate turnoff, um, I, I go back to the integrity uh, piece as well. Um, there are way too many people in this world who unfortunately don't have integrity. And so like trying to make, uh, uh, in my opinion, okay, Warren Buffett's word, trying to make a good deal with a bad person just doesn't work. Like it just doesn't work. It doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, it just doesn't work. Okay, I'm going to throw a third Buffettism in there. <laughs> he it. also says, he also says, in your business partners and the people you do business with, you want three attributes. You want energy, intelligence, and integrity. Hmm. And you need all three because if you don't have the third one, the first two will kill you. And that's that's 100% so true. true. Yeah. I love yeah. that. All right, thanks, Dan. So now I want to open up the, 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 the crowd. Any questions for the panel? I know. Yes, in the back, please. Hi, uh, my name is George. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you for stepping up. We can hey, barely see without the lights in It's like being on the stage. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I have a very unique investor situation in that my customers are my ideal investors because mm -hmm. if I solve this problem, it solves most of their most serious problems. And if I don't even try or they don't support me, they will likely not exist in 10 years. So, um, uh, but the problem is, so I work in the fireworks industry and I'm trying to build a fireworks manufacturing operation in Brazil. And um, the investor, or the, 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 my customers slash investors know nothing about your type of investing, which is, I think is the ideal way to proceed with organizing the company. Um, all of them, uh, you know, 40 years ago, started their company out the back of their mm -hmm. and And that's how they know it. Mm -hmm. And um, so from your perspective, how do you think I should approach them to re-educate them or educate them on what it means to be a group of investors investing in a business wherein the founders or someone other than them has sort of the majority of the control and the authority to actually build and run that business? So you would be distributing to them? Yes, they're uh, buying your product, and, and, and we we had our first success. Our, sorry, the, our first breakthrough in April, April, which was the first ever container fully tested compliant consumer firework shipped from Brazil to the United States, and it hit the market this Fourth of July season. And oh. uh, people always ask me how it went, and I say I got literally no customer feedback, which means that it completely integrated into the other products in the uh, in the stores, and uh, you know didn't stand out in any negative. How many questions? <laughs> yeah. Give me a uh, one. So you're you're asking um, how you educate the people you want investing in your company. 
Um, each one. Was, so let's say I, I'm going to I'm going to approach seven different companies, and I want them all to invest five hundred thousand dollars, and they all want one hundred percent ownership of the company. Uh, How do I get right. them? But they're also your customers. They're also my customers. And they, and if, and if, if but I my question is, should they be your investors? Yeah, like, I, I actually would flip it question, and say, yeah. I don't know if your customers should be your investors unless you are actually going to build a, a whole new company where, you know, they're a consortium, so to speak, of founders. But I, I would say if, if they're your customers and they're good customers, why do they need to be your investors? I would get investment in a the, different the, the problem I found, because I've been working on this problem with yeah. one former and others for the last well, since 2019. And what I find is that when I go out to sort of the general investment world, mm -hmm. nobody understands fireworks. Mm -hmm. Everybody it just immediately walks away from it. And the capital requirement yep. compared Huge. to the ROI, you know, for the investor, it doesn't fit the normal profile. So, I mean, it's a manufacturing business. So there's a lot right. of direct costs and there's not like an, any exponential growth. Like if you want to grow, you better build more manufacturing capability and spend more materials. And everything. Can, I, can I ask a question about your customers? Are you selling to the tribal nations or? No, if, no. So I'm selling to the people that would sell to the tribal nations. Okay. And most of them are in, in the Midwest or not. So that's interesting because I would have said I'd go get money. I'd go work with them. So someone else recommended that, but I, I could never get through the to The people of the nations, right. Because you're not indigenous. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Sure. Any other questions? Yes, right here. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. It's a total addressable market or, um, yeah, how how big is the problem you're trying to solve and how much uh, capital is in that market for that problem? I also heard TOC versus MVP. <laughs> So MVP is a minimum viable product and POC is a proof of concept. So POC could be a little bit earlier than MVP. MVP is like a working product, whereas a POC could be a prototype, but it's it's a minimum version of a product that someone with the core capability someone can use. And you can think about in a way that no beautiful front end, very not easy onboarding, no self-serve, but what are you, the, your core idea is implemented in the most simplified but usable way. I would also just say with MVP, and I know you've seen this, is that a lot of new companies when they're building, say a software product, will keep trying to make it perfect. Yeah. And perfection is the death of any startup. So <laughs> like an MVP is your golden ticket, right? Like get that MVP out there, let people pound on it, because you're going to learn so much sure. and do not wait. I mean, I've seen so many companies do that where, you know, five years and they don't have an MVP yet because they keep saying, oh, we should add this feature or we should add this feature. No, yeah. just what literally is the minimally yeah. viable product and get it out there. A couple of can. months of MVP. Yeah. We also, at times, when we see a, see a product that's too mature and even before it hits the market, we were like, wait, if they have to kind of pivot based on what, the mm -hmm. customer wants they have to just undo and redo a lot of stuff and yep. it's more investment yep. so having a frugal mvp is actually more important than having a solid beautiful product which customer has never seen yeah. right, any other questions for the panel <laughs> okay so moving on what's your take on this like a founder's raising money right and that they, they have raised no money right how wouldn't they stop and reassess and start over like four months, five months, six months? Like they're going, to, they're going like six months. Maybe has like a couple thousand dollars here, maybe some soft money, but nothing like they need. Right. Wouldn't they stop and like maybe focus on a product or something like that? Right. I'll go with you first. Danny. Gosh, I mean, this is a hard one. When do you know when to quit anything? Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's hard to know. It, it, it's hard to know. I mean, you could be that one conversation away from just, you know, blowing up. Right. So, who, who knows? Um, I, I think that uh, if I were just to put myself in their shoes, I would say if I keep on running into walls, um, I would try to find ways to, you know, meaningfully, maybe even radically change my approach, whether it's that like, um, hey, we're going to completely change, uh, you know, industries, you know, products, whatever, like uh, we, we need to, maybe I just need to take some time off. Maybe I need to go get a job, right, somewhere and think about it some time or do something different, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give one example from my own past experience. Not, I'm not responsible for this at all, but uh, it is something I experienced. Um, 
I was at, uh, I mentioned before, a, a drone delivery company called Zipline. They weren't always called Zipline. They were called Remotive before, and that's what I joined. And initially, we made a robotic toy that you docked your iPhone on. And this toy was uh, interesting enough. This was before I, I arrived at the company. Um, interesting enough that Tony Shea, the, uh, the founder of Zappos, invested in the company brought the company over to, actually they were here in Techstars in Seattle and then brought them down to Vegas for the Vegas Tech Fund. And then through there, um, they kept on getting more and more buzz and selling more products. Uh, uh, Alfred Lin from Sequoia uh, then led the Series A for the company. And so now they were kind of in the big leagues. They moved to San Francisco, et cetera. And I joined the company shortly thereafter. Um, well, it turned out this robotic toy, um, the what seemed like a lot of buzz for it, you know, the biggest Kickstarter ever at the time, things like that. Um, product market fit wasn't really there ultimately. Mm -hmm. uh, and so after a big retail launch, the product didn't do that well. Uh, the, comp the, the founders and the leadership team could have continued to invest in, the, in this specific toy and things like that, but they chose not to. They chose to completely pivot. They said, hey, we're a robotics company. We have a robotics team. We have chemical engineers, mm -hmm. electrical engineers, things like that. But we need to do something different. And they said, what can we do that's bigger than this? All right, we're going to pie in the sky, drone delivery. They still had money in the bank. Um, so they were able to pitch. And you know, credit to the team, they were able to pitch, hey, we're going to completely pivot, do something completely different that you weren't thinking about at all. But we have a team to do this. We're, we're the right people to do this. And they got the right investors. And you're talking about selling, right? They, they sold the right investors and the right partners. And you know now... Gosh, I, I don't even know how much money, how many billions of dollars they've raised or hundreds of millions of dollars they've raised or you know, valued in the billions doing drone delivery. So, yeah. Interesting. See. Wonderful. I'm going to answer this in a slightly different way of like a lot of times when I meet founders, first of all, to be able to raise funding, why is that? Why is it that the funding has been hard? Is it a really a venture scale business? I'm just talking about from a venture point of view, right? Why was the no? Is it you definitely there's traction, but we also see a founder come and say, hey, we had a half a million, we're going to make next year a million, great 100% growth, and then need funding. Well, will that be at IPO, the average or median uh, revenue is anywhere between 100 to 400 million, right? Is there a path to that? And once you got IPO, then you become like a billion dollar revenue company. The reason is like, is there an investor business model and a founder business model mismatches why you don't get the funding, do you have to, as you said, rethink your strategy mm -hmm. and say, I need a different kind of investor? Um, that's one. Mm -hmm. Secondly, telling a company is like, build a business for your customers, not for the investors. And when you build a company for customers, of course, investors come in not to make, I mean, some do with Angel but to help you build your MVP, but investors like to think that they'll come in and take your company from X amount of growth to hyper growth. But if it means that they don't come, your invest your company is going to be dead, that's not a good situation to come in. You have to build a business which survives on its own. Um, and then angel money, friends and family, different sources of capital. I know at times it's easier said than done because some are CapEx heavy uh, businesses, some of them need R&D, but in general, can you survive without a venture investor? And only when you get the venture investor with a really like hyperscale your growth. So founder investor match kind of business. And then like, how will, why is the investor coming in to your company? These things matter. So I take a step back, reflecting and seeing what do you need to change? Focus on building your business or the other option maybe this is not a problem it's too ahead of the market or maybe something may some so some of the problems that couldn't be solved two years back are being solved today so maybe it's a timing issue so a founder knows they have a they have a gut feeling they know it right, just you, listen you. to the gut feeling yes mm -hmm. margaret yeah you made me think of i was working with a woman an inventor who had a consumer product and it was self-funded and then I started working with her and she was running out of money and she had all her money went into inventory. Right. And so I helped her kind of improve her marketing and her website and her, you know, how she was doing e-commerce and all those things. And what we realized, and she was at that point, like, I don't have, I don't have the, like the energy left. I don't have, like, I've been just do doing this on my own. Right. So what kind of re-energized her is we started looking at, are you really going after the entire market? Like she was kind of 
throwing noodles to the wall, right? Like this is a consumer product that anyone would like. Like here's why everyone would enjoy this product. It's like, okay, but who would really need it? Like there's gotta be niches, right? And when we started really breaking down into smaller markets, like the RV market, the college student market, you know, the elderly market, because this product was like an ease of use thing. And then looked at the addressable market, looked at, you know, what, what would be a costing strategy there. And then actually started going and talking to those markets more specifically. And then we found a distribution channel with an RV company, right? So it was like a completely different way of thinking about this problem rather than just saying, this is a great product that everyone would like, which is where she started. And so, and I think we do that a lot because we'll see anyone could use this. Yes. Mm. But trying to go out to the market to everyone is very hard and you don't have the money mm. as a startup. So start to look at what are very specific use cases or niches of the market and then put all your energy in that, like go test it, go talk to a million mm -hmm. people. You know, I mean, she started going to those um, like Saturday markets. <laughs> you know, with the product and just seeking out people in some of these niches. So very guerrilla, you know, marketing, which is brilliant. Like do that kind of thing. Like you've got to get out there. I know that sounds funny in this day of, you know, digital everything, but that's where she had the conversations that we got focused. And then she got funding for that niche, mm -hmm. built that thing and went on from there and did very, very well. And now is, you know, building the business. So I think that's the best story I can think of that kind of feeds into what both of you are saying. It was a very, you know, self-starting founder inventor, very scrappy. Thank you, Margaret. Christopher? Yeah, uh, the rest of the panelists made great points. Um, know your market, find your niche, find the right investors. Uh, like your question earlier, mm. are you talking to manufacturing investors, for example? Like you mentioned, manufacturing is the main component of your business. Uh, finding that niche and having those conversations with the right people is, the, is a great starting point to get the right kind of notes. Mm -hmm. And then I would even flip the question on his head and and tell founders, don't stop too early. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you know, you mentioned like when to stop, but don't stop too early. Yeah. Um, if you haven't met with 100, 100 investors in that niche or um, the right kind of people or the right kind of investors for your product, don't stop mm -hmm. or don't change unnecessarily. Yeah, I, I think so, too many founders like, Talk to ten people and they they, they stop. Yeah, that's what they get. Like. Two or three no's and they're like, oh, my product's no good. Uh, I don't want to continue raising money. Um, you know, so having that. Um, There's that so mindset, many stories like that. Yeah, too, exactly, right? mm -hmm. having that mindset of um, of taking no's on the chin and it not affecting your business or not affecting your vision is is critical for founders. So um, I'd say a good benchmark not reaching out to a hundred founders, but sitting down with a hundred founders and then take that feedback from there if you're getting funding or not, and then just change your business, finding the right markets, um, et cetera. So, so next question, start with Christopher. Suppose there's a company out there you want to invest in, right? How do you convince them so that you can invest in a company? Like what, what value do you add to, to a founder or like, you know, what, how do you convince a founder? I want to invest in a company, to take my money. <laughs> that makes any sense. Well, I'm turning the question on to me. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> No, I think I think that's important, right? Like uh, we we're interviewing founders for the right characteristics that we want to invest in as a pre-seed. I think founders should also be interviewing mm -hmm. the investor as well, vice versa. Um, do we have that network of people that's going to ultimately help you reach your goal? Um, do we have that operational experience that's going to help your business thrive in whatever market or um, enterprise you want to succeed in? Uh, is is our platform a right fit for you? If we're not a lead investor and you just need money, fine. Or if we're the lead investor, are you really going to make that difference for us? I don't think you should just take anybody's money. If you're a business, find the right investor. And that right investor can can sometimes make or break what you're doing, and especially in the early stages. Um, so as to why they might choose 161 Ventures as a pre-seed fund, uh, I think we have a great platform. Uh, we consistently host um, events with successful entrepreneurs, successful investors that actually lead to uh, impactful changes and in somebody's early stage startup. As a matter of fact, we've made 11 investments and several of our portfolio companies have said, 
we're the most impactful investors on their cap table. Mm -hmm. Um, we've either helped them get resources for their startup, uh, engineering or otherwise, or help them raise additional capital, not from us. So I think finding the right investor, um, is critical and interviewing both ways is also important. Thank you, Christopher. Margaret? Yeah, I agree so much. I, I thought of something when you said have a hundred meetings. I used to always say whenever I was trying to pivot or do something different, whether it was a startup or something else, it was a hundred cups of coffee, mm -hmm. right? I always had that in my mind. I've got to go have a hundred mm -hmm. cups of coffee. Like you, you just buy people coffee, so mm -hmm. you, you know, have yep. enough information. But I'm going to go back to that integrity word. Um, there are a lot of investors without integrity too. Um, <laughs> and uh, I've met some of them. So I think you you need to make sure that you are interviewing the investor, but more importantly, do they share your values? Like, what are your core values? Separate from your product, <laughs> separate from everything else. Um, make sure your investor shares those core values. Because um, I've gone in with, you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, my, you know, diversity, inclusion, mindset, and then I get just smacked down, you know, uh, big time. And so if they don't care about your your people side, your soul, they're not going to care about your business, right? And and we're, we're human. So I, I think there has to be that connection of, is it smart from the type of business you're doing? So if they have great experience in B2B software, and that is your product, great. Look for someone with that experience. You need someone that understands that market, mm -hmm. right? If you have a consumer toy, well, go find someone that understands that market, right? So that's kind of the base. And then look for who they have in their network. Who else have they invested in? How have those companies done? You know, how have they treated their founders? There's a lot of, you know, investment funds that they get the founders in. As soon as you start making money, that CEO is gone, right? So will they bring you board members? Will they bring you advisors? Um, that is the stuff that is golden, right? In those early days, that's what you need. Um, and, and they're investing in you. They're investing in your idea. Yes but they're going to surround you with people that are going to make you better. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Margaret. T? Completely agree. <laughs> uh, I'll just add, I mean, you both covered most of it, is we actually ask our founders towards the end, what, what are you looking for in, in an investor? Why us? And we all think about it in a way like B2B SaaS, software. We have a lot of expertise in the region. That's why we come in very early stage in the region of very few like when a company is doing well, they are going to a series A, that's the outcome we want. A lot of outside investors come in to help them out. But in the early stages, you need an investor that does not only give you the money, but also helps you grow, as you said, network of advisor, network of people and other portfolio companies looking at the success, but also partnership. Like, do you look at the time horizon that they need? Are they patient uh, to stay with you for a long time? Or do they have the end of the fund constraints? A lot of things come into play, but also say there's a company in real estate software. You need software experience, but you also need strategic investors, maybe writing smaller checks from the real estate industry to help you make those connections. So it could be multiple ways investors come in, but as a lead investor, you're going to spend a lot of time with them and Another thing I would say to look for, I mean, my two cents is investors ideally should not be prescriptive, not tell them how to run the company, but ask the right questions, make the right introductions. Otherwise, if you put an idea and someone else is executing, it doesn't make sense. So we are hyper uh, aware of this part where even if we feel something based on our judgment, we'll just put the questions and maybe say, help them figure it out, but we'll never put it out there directly. It is for the founder to find out and take the right path. So kind of looking at the persona, even when you look at a VC firm, you're, you're going to be working with a partner or even an angel, you're going to be working with a specific angel. So how, how do you connect with them mm -hmm. in a room when you have like really tense situations is also important. Thank you, T. Dan? I think the panel covered it beautifully. <laughs> and the only thing I have to add is something from my personal experience, which is that um, you know, the, I've noticed the deals that I've been, where I'm just a check and almost nothing else have been the least fulfilling, yeah. maybe not necessarily the least financially successful, but um, the least fulfilling for me personally. Whereas the most recent investment I made, um, the company is relying on me regularly for 
expertise on personal finance and financial planning and investments and things like that because the company is directly involved in that space. And that has been both rewarding and I think the company is doing well, which is really, really nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could I add one yes. thing to this? Yes, yes, please. When you find an investor that you think is a good match, go wherever they are. I will just tell a personal thing. I got on a plane to Boulder for a 20 minute yeah. meeting, spent 24 hours in Boulder, but that 20 minute meeting was successful. Um, and it was weird because the guy did not have shoes on during the meeting, <laughs> but he knew this Very space better. really well. I don't know if you've been to Boulder, but it's a weird fucking place. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, but it was worth it. Like it was, and it was at the time that was like, just flying there was a big deal. Financially staying in a hotel, like it was a big deal, but it was like, I knew that 20 minutes was going to make or break it. Mm -hmm. And it did. So just do it. And the fact I got that meeting was like a friend of 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 a friend. So like, look for the investors that are right for what you're doing. And then just find somebody that knows them and beg, steal and borrow and get 30 minutes. Thank Sorry, you. Sorry, that's just... no worries. <laughs> yeah. So Dan, next question. Is there something I should ask you that I haven't? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Put me on the spot here. Uh, gosh. Um, well, I'm on the spot, so I have to come up with it. Um, hmm. Yeah, uh, I think, and you know, if I, I'm trying to put myself in the you know the shoes of uh, the folks who are kindly listening to us here in the audience, um, you know, maybe specifically, um, you know, what specific deals, what specific industries are we looking at? I know for some of the investors here, we've already talked about that, but I don't think I talked about that about myself, so I'll, I'll mention it. Um, I've done investments, um, you know, ranging from uh, you know, things that I don't understand too, too well, but I definitely knew, knew the teams well and I trusted them in, you know, uh, medical device technology, things like that, right? Um, where I felt a lot of confidence in the team. I, I believe in what they've done. They've shown me traction, things like that. Great. Uh, other investments I've done are in, again, personal finance, um, you know, uh, investment management space, that sort of thing. And that's what I do as my day job. And so I feel much more comfortable to evaluate that, even if it's not necessarily, um, you know, a team that I know that well. Um, and then beyond that, for me, uh, consumer packaged goods um, are the other thing that I've looked at and I've invested in. So if there's anybody in the audience who is, you know, in those three particular things, I know they're pretty disparate. Um, you know, I'll, I'll look at B2B software too. I, I'll consider it, but I just let you know that it's not something that I, I particularly have any expertise on. Um, those three particular things, I'd be happy to chat about them more specifically if that's what you're working on. All right, T, same question for you. What's something I should have asked you that I haven't? I'm sure there are so many questions uh, that ought to be discussed. I don't have anything at the top of the head to kind of, uh, point out too so it's been a great discussion I think one of the things I thought I'll add from the last uh, question was uh, I, our partnership with founders is something that we have found our biggest asset and one of the things that we are not really out there all the time talking about ourselves but our founders do our job of like talking about Trilogy which has been a great experience since the day I joined the team helping them solve so many different kinds of uh, problems, starting from financial modeling to hiring their first salesperson, the first marketing person, the person who goes to become their co-founder. It's been such a huge spectrum. So I think that's where, since this is called finding a right investor, that's where it comes in. And being thoughtful about that is always going to help when the company is being built from zero to 10. Once you're 10, there'll be so many people who come to help help you out, but this is the most crucial part. Thank you, T. Margaret, for you. Something I didn't ask you that I should have. The question that came to mind was, how do you keep believing in yourself? Because the vast majority of the public will think you're crazy. And the example I'll give is, I lived in Taiwan for 10 years in the 90s, and I started a company there. And in Taiwan, people were amazing. So I'm a five foot 10, very pale Irish American living in Taiwan. And every Taiwanese Chinese person I met would be like, great, what's the company? Who Do you need printing? Do you need advertising? Do you need this? Do you, they immediately go into supply chain mode, right? Do you need investors? Do you need da da da? What are you selling? Like they just, because it's such a normal part of life. Of course, you're starting a company. That makes perfect sense. Tell me how to fit it into my ecosystem, my supply chain. How can I help? I would, and I was 30 years old. So let me give that context too, right? So now you know how old I am. Um, and 
I would come home to America and they'd be like, well, what makes you think you can start a company? You're not even Chinese. You're only 30 years old. Have you ever started a company before? And so I very quickly realized I am not listening to that. I am not taking that input. And I would just surround myself with people who either had been in that world, believed in me, asked me questions, was curious, because it was so easy to get sucked into this energy of like, why am I doing this? What makes me think I can do this? Am I crazy? I, I don't have any right to do this. I'm not even, you know, from Taiwan, blah, blah, blah. And it, it just, I learned very quickly, surround yourself with people who love and support you or just support the idea. Mm -hmm. And just honestly, even if it's your mother, ignore them for a while. <laughs> not that that happened, but maybe it did. <laughs> um, you know, until you kind of get it done because I'm just going to tell you, and you probably already experienced this if you're starting a company, 99.9% .9 of the people you meet are not going to be like these people. They're going to be like, you have no right to start a company. You know, 90% of companies fail. I mean, I started a restaurant, 75% of restaurants fail. You should never invest in a restaurant. Okay. Like we've done great, but it's just, I'm just, it's just the, you know, the human psyche. So that's, that's what I would say. Thank you, Margaret. Christopher, how about great. for you? That's no, great. Uh, <laughs> be a little crazy. Why not? Um, <laughs> Yeah, something that, that came to my mind at the end here is um, where to find investors, right? Um, I think the best way to get in front of investors is face-to-face. -face. Um, of course, cold emailing or getting a warm introduction for a Zoom meeting is great, but it's not as impactful as a face-to-face -face meeting. And where are investors normally? Uh, put yourself in the shoes of an investor. The bar. <laughs> happy hour maybe um obviously panel discussions like this coming up to investors afterwards is a great starting point um, look for uh vc events maybe vc hosted event is a great starting point uh angel networks you mentioned the seattle angel conference mm -hmm. um reaching out to anybody on linkedin from there or finding events that they may sponsor or host is a great point um, accelerators or incubators a lot of investors are going to circle around where talent congregates so those programs can be great starting points to find investors. And then uh, just situational luck. If you're not finding investors, put yourself in a situation that you're not used to being in. Um, that can drive change for you if you're stagnating your growth. Um, yeah, just where to find investors is, I mean, it's not super difficult. There's been a big influx in venture capital around the world in the past 10 years. Um, but uh, for a first time founder, it may seem like a daunting task, especially if you're looking for the right investor. All right, so Chris, for next one, I wanna thank all the panelists for doing this. So two more questions. First one is, what can we do for you? Do you have to ask for anybody or anything that we can do for you? Um, well, yeah, I guess I can give an ask. I don't typically like to start with an ask. I like to start with a give, but uh, if, yeah, I'll I'll start with a gift first. If you're a first time founder or a founder working on a pre seed stage company and you might need some kind of advice, we have collectively between the partners of our fund about ten thousand usable connections that we can make for you guys in different areas or industries. So I could offer some kind of advice for that. Um, and ask I might give. I'm working on a publication right now, I'm publishing a coffee table book on. Uh, innovative startups or companies in government or maybe a dual use tech mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. So if you know of any companies that should be featured in that, definitely reach out to me so I can chat with them. And then maybe 20 or so thought leaders on policy change that could be an AI or just around tech in general in government. Uh, I'd love to chat with those people as well. Right, thanks. How about for you, Margaret? Anything we can help you with? I can't think of an ask. I mean, I would just make it personal to say, you know, keep believing in yourself and Go get those hundred cups of coffee. Like just hit the road. Yes. How about you? How about you, T? I mean, many more of panels like this all over all over Washington, uh, Seattle too. Uh, no, this is great. This has been a great discussion. A great group. And yeah, I mean, all the things that we said. If there are any questions after this, feel free to reach out uh, to us. Always happy to talk and offer the time. Thanks, T. Dan. So, that for me, I'm always interested in talking to and meeting interesting people, considering deals and things like that. My personal um, availability of capital, because I am just an angel investor, I don't have a fund or anything like that, uh, waxes and wanes uh, with uh, different you know, personal financial situations. But 
uh, you know, I'm always very interested to meet folks who have ideas or who are working on something because I have to put myself out there. I have to say, hey, I actively do this. Otherwise, no one knows, right? And I, it's like, it doesn't say on my you know, LinkedIn profile. I, I could say it, but like, that's not what I'm trying to advertise mainly. <laughs> trying to advertise my day job, right? Like, it doesn't say on my LinkedIn profile. Please call me if you have <laughs> But I'm saying creepy. that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm saying that here because this is the right audience for it. Um, that, that would be my ask. Is I'm, I'm always interested to eat, meet interesting people who are going to interesting ideas. So this would be the last one. Give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about. Oh, gosh. Um, all right. Come back to me again. Uh, so this is just going to be for me on the, you know, more on the personal finance side, because that is my realm of expertise. Um, and what I'll say is that uh, there is a, there's a strong component. If, um, you know, you personally haven't run into it yet, uh, you will of making sure your personal finances are in order before you become an entrepreneur or before you think about going down that path. Uh, a lot of people don't consider it. They have, they're so caught up in their idea and they, they love their idea and maybe even their idea has some traction, which is great, but you have to think about the impact it's gonna have on you um, outside of just your business, right? You still need to be able to you know, uh, live somewhere, feed yourself, clothe yourself, uh, maybe have a family to take care of, things like that too. And so, you know, that aspect of things is also something I'm very comfortable talking about, you know, having started my own business, et cetera, uh, and making sure I was in the right financial position to do so before um, before I did. And so that's a consideration I feel like isn't always talked about enough. I know folks do bring it up, but I particularly, that's what I do for a living. So I'm always happy to chat about that. Mm. All right, thank you. T? I think enough was said on this panel. So nothing to add, just reiterating, build the business and the company for your customers. And they are your biggest champions. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, I'm going to build on what Dan said. Marriage counseling is really good too, just for that. Like, no, but seriously, startups are hard on relationships financially. Um, and so just take care of that part of it too. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I go on the reverse side of what they said. Not marriage counseling? No, no, no. Not, We're not uh, with her. Not not that. That. <laughs> um, I would say don't start a business unless you're, uh, comfortable not making any money for several years yeah. mm -hmm. um, because that's oftentimes the case right like mm -hmm. you're not going to be profitable for quite a while uh, it's not always the case but um, unless you have that mindset of starting from zero or failing back to zero after you've made it quite a way don't don't even get into this business all right thanks so i want to thank the panelists for doing this i really appreciate you thanks all right, thank you everyone for your time today. And uh, they'll be around for a little bit to add to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And yeah, let's, take a, let's, let's take a picture real fast. Yeah. Yeah. Sit. Just sitting. Uh, sitting yeah. or standing? Sit or stand or. Sitting's great. I don't Sitting's mind. Good. You don't mind sitting? Okay. You want to yeah. squish together? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, I think my I think my camera oh. can get it. So we're... <laughs> don't squish. squish. It's on point five. Okay. That's right. <laughs> point five. Do you want me to? No, no. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs>